But it feels as if there's a, a, a really, really big idea missing. You know, there's some, something missing in our picture of the universe. Someone in the next maybe 10, 15 years is going to come up with a missing idea. And it's all going to fit together in a much more logical fashion. So I have a real feeling that there's a revolution around the corner. You know, I mean, possibly of, of the kind of uh, scale of quantum theory, you know, because, I mean, we can't really have uh, our best physical theory, you know, predicting something and being wrong by, you know, one followed by 120 <laughs> zeros. You know, that is, that is really bad. <laughs> the last time there was such a big discrepancy was in, in about 1910 and 1909, and that was when Ernest Rutherford, obviously a New Zealander, um, discovered the structure of the atom, and he discovered that uh, there was this incredibly tiny nucleus at the centre of an atom like a sun, and the electrons orbited around like planets. Um, but the standard picture of physics said that those electrons should shed energy and spiral into the nucleus in a hundred millionth of a second. Well, of course, we know that the atoms that we're made of, well, they certainly survive for our lifetime, and we think they've survived for billions of years. And that was a discrepancy between... Um, an observation and a prediction of one followed by 40 zeros. Yeah. And that led to a revolution. That led to quantum theory. Uh, the explanation of why electrons don't fall into nuclei requires quantum theory, which sees the building blocks of, of matter as kind of simultaneously... Um, you can't get your head around this, but they're simultaneously tiny little bullet-like particles, and they're also spread out waves, like waves on, on Sydney Harbour. And it's because waves are spread out things and they require elbow room that the <laughs> electrons in an atom require elbow room and so they're actually, you know, atoms are bit relatively big and, and they don't fall into the nucleus. Um, it, it's astonishing. I can't remember, can't remember where I, where, where no, I was we're just talking, we're, we're, it's, it's all right. <laughs> we were talking about um, the revolution that followed that, uh, that giant discrepancy. And I'm really fascinated to hear you, uh, first of all, having dismantled everything that all astrophysicists hold dear in terms of inflation and dark matter and dark energy. And I'm a journalist, not a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I do believe that it's um, a, a very interesting prospect to look at the idea that uh, perhaps we are on the brink of some new theory that will rationalise these apparent uh, bolted-on solutions and apparent inconsistencies. And I'd like to know where you, as somebody who keeps a watch on all this kind of thing, uh, where you think that's going to come from? What kind of ideas might people have that will reconcile uh, relativity and quantum theory at the same time as demonstrating that perhaps inflation's not necessary, perhaps dark energy's not necessary, and that we've all been missing the point? It's very difficult to know uh, at the moment. But, I mean, if, you, if I could mention some ideas that, that are off the wall that, that, that are interesting, I mean, you probably know about Mond. Yes, uh, Mond. You know, one of the yes. problems that... I talked talk, talk about dark matter. We need a lot of dark matter, six or seven times as much dark matter as there is visible stuff. To really sp so its gravity speeds up the kind of coalescence of galaxies mm. so they can be made. But we, we also know that we need dark matter because when we look at spiral galaxies like our own Milky Way, we look at the stars orbiting in the outer regions and then they're just going around too fast. They're like children on a speeded-up merry-go-round. You yeah. know, they ought to be flung off. <laughs> so we postulate that there has to be you know, a lot more dark matter in our galaxy whose gravity is holding on to those stars. And uh, we need a, a different amount of dark matter in virtually every galaxy. I mean, some of them we need about 99%, yes, I believe. Yes, yeah. that's right. Uh, mm. But in, in, in the early 80s, a, a, an Israeli physicist called uh, Moti Milgram yeah. um, kind of looked at the, how, how the stars are, are moving in spiral galaxies, and he thought, what, what if gravity was different? You know, what, what if Newtonian gravity uh, works on the everyday scale and it works in um, our solar system? Maybe on the larger scales, um, it doesn't actually weaken as fast as we expect. In fact, it's not on large scales, it's on, large, on, on low accelerations. Yes, right. And his formula, which contains only one number, and that is the, 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 this tiny little acceleration at which gravity switches from being the, the kind, the, the kind of uh, uh, weak form that we know to a slightly stronger form that falls off with distance slightly less quickly. With this one number, he can explain the motion of stars orbiting in every single spiral galaxy we've ever seen. Yes. <laughs> with dark matter, you have to have different amounts of dark matter in each galaxy. It has to be distributed differently. 
Um, so, you know, even on, on the, um, if you're thinking about economy, this is a much more economical idea. Uh, the only problem is um, it's an empirical idea. You know, at the moment it's kind of just a descriptive. Although actually another Israeli has, has actually found a relativistic form, a form that okay. is compatible with Einstein's theory of relativity. Right. Um, so this is just a very interesting idea. At the bare minimum, the people who believe in dark matter have to explain how dark matter clumps in such a way as to reproduce Milgram's formula. So again, I don't know where, where, the, where, the, where the idea is coming from. I actually wrote an article in New Scientist recently about the possibility that gravity has three regimes. Yes. You know, that, it, that it's actually follows, it drops off with an inverse square law on the local scale. So, you know, if you separate two masses, if, if they're twice as far apart, gravity is four times as weak. If they're three times as far apart, they're nine times, it's nine times as weak. Then there's a kind of transition region on, on the scales close to the size of galaxies where it's actually only about a third stronger. Mm -hmm. And then on the, on the very large scale, it, it, it actually falls off with, with distance much much quicker. I mean, it seems quite messy, um, but this is an outgrowth of string theory as well. So I yeah. think there's just, at the moment, we just don't really know where it's all going, but there's something desperately, desperately wrong, and there's something missing. And to me, that's what makes science very exciting. Yeah. Um, we, you know, I think we're incredibly privileged to be alive today. You know, we, can, we, can, we know the extent of our observable universe and its content. You know, we can see to the edge... Um, and we can count up the building blocks of the universe, which are galaxies. I think they're about 100 billion, something like that, the last count. Uh, that, that, that can be observed. That's that right. can be observed. And probably many more beyond that that can't be observed. Yeah, and we have yeah. a really good idea where it all came from. We do think that it actually burst into being about 14 billion years ago in a big bang. And as I say, the debris has been cooling and the galaxies have been forming ever since. So it's a privilege to be alive. Previous generations would have killed for this kind of picture of where we are. Um, but, but what makes it even more exciting is with this picture, um, we can begin to ask truly fundamental questions about the universe, origin questions, and have a really good chance of answering them, maybe in the next 10, 20 years. You know, what was the Big Bang? What drove the Big Bang? What happened before the Big Bang? You know, why is there something in the universe rather than, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? Which is the ultimate cosmological question. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's just great to be alive at this time when we can ask these questions and the answers are not, no longer sort of theological speculation. Yeah, they're actually scientific questions and we will we'll know the answer, you know, pretty soon. Can, can we ever know everything, Marcus? Well, that's a philosophical question, isn't it? Can we ever know everything? Um, you know, can the universe ever understand itself? Can the human brain ever understand yes. itself? I mean, you know, we've done very well. You know, our brain is three pounds of jelly and water. And, uh, you know, we've, 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 we've begun... Two and, to, two and a half in my case. Two and a half in your case. And, we've, you, know, we, we've got a, you know, we've come a long way. And, and, and it's very, we have a really good picture of... of, of um, of, um, you know, where we are. But I think it was Newton that said, wasn't it, the great, greater the, I can't remember the quote, you know, the greater the, uh, the continent of knowledge or something, the, the greater the shoreline of the unknown. Big, that's right. So, yes. you know, yes. we have many, many more questions than we ever had before. Well, that's <laughs> but, absolutely right. But we can, you know, in the question lies the answer. You know, if you can phrase the question precisely, which is what we're doing, you have a good chance of answering it. It's wonderful stuff, isn't it, that um, we can, uh, uh, as you say, with this three pounds of jelly water. Three pounds of jelly and water. <laughs> two and a half in your case. We can, we can work it out. Um, I, I'd like, if I may, in the few remaining minutes that we have before we invite a few questions from, uh, from you, you people here, um, w whether we can uh, turn from uh, Marcus Chown, the commentator on the universe, uh, to Marcus Chown, the man, because um, you and I share a few things in common, and I'm interested to, uh, to hear about uh, uh, your prognosis. Uh, for example, one thing I wanted to ask you about is that uh, in about a month, um, I will take myself and my colleague David Malin, who's a very famous astronomical photographer, um, on, a, on a cruise around northern Australia on a boat called the Orion, that's an appropriate name, isn't it? <laughs> um, to, to go and look at the skies. And you um, were telling me that you've done cruises like this and that there are certain pitfalls that you've got to watch out for. 
I did one. Yeah, I did go on a cruise with very, very rich Americans. Uh, and uh, yeah, there were some pitfalls. We went around Madagascar and the Seychelles. This was a Halley's Comet cruise. And it was, we went in the cyclone season. And uh, the crew, which were Yugoslav at the time, it, Yugoslavia hadn't split up. They'd never been out of the Mediterranean before. And it was a flat bottom boat. And uh, I do remember being in my cabin for two days living on toothpaste <laughs> because um, it was just. I mean, you couldn't even sleep because uh, it was rolling and pitching so much that I kept falling out of bed. Um, so, yeah, I did venture up after a couple of days. Um, they had a cat's cradle of ropes around the ship. and uh, kept everybody on. Yeah, and I, and I had some Rice Krispies, but then I was watching the horizon going up and down, and I felt very sick. I went out on deck and sat on a deck chair, and, 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 and the ship rolled, and I nearly fell off the ship. So, uh, and uh, one of the other things that happened is that when I gave a talk, six people were asleep. <laughs> and, and I said to the cruise director, oh, you know, I must have done a really boring talk, you know. And he said, don't worry, somebody died in the last talk. <laughs> so, 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 and that was very typical because the average age was about 70. <laughs> and they did tell me that when people did die, uh, they would put them in the freezer um, <laughs> because... Um, and unfortunately, they, off of Madagascar, Madagascan people are quite small, and so they could only get small coffins, and they had to saw their legs off in order to uh, send them back to America. I hope none of the family ever opened the coffin. <laughs> so the moral of this is never die in one of Marcus's talks, because you might get your legs sawed off. So I hope you have an entertaining time. Yeah. I mean, it was a trip of a lifetime. I was so, yes, I'm sure it so, was. So, <laughs> I did get stung by a swarm of... Madagascan wasps, uh, and the doctor on board said that they were deadly, uh, but, but fortunately they weren't. <laughs> he was lying. <laughs> yeah, so it was uh, very interesting, yes. Well, um, <clears throat> if anybody's coming on the Orion cruise around northern <laughs> Australia, please stay alive until the end. We'd like you to do that. And also, um, I was fascinated to know that um, among your teachers, because you uh, were at Caltech, weren't you? You studied at Caltech yeah. for a while. And among your teachers was the, the legendary Richard Feynman, who, um, who actually yeah. wrote a letter to your mother. Yeah, I, I was a dropout at Caltech. I went to an American university. It was full of Nobel Prize winners. Um, and I really, well, I enjoyed being in California, but I didn't enjoy being at Caltech very much. But the, one of the great things was I was taught by a physicist, I'm a terrible name dropper, by a physicist <laughs> called Richard Feynman. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he was probably the greatest post-war physicist. He worked on the atomic bomb in, when he, in his 20s. And uh, before I went as a student, I did actually see a television program about him. In, in Britain, it's called uh, Horizon. And in America, it's Nova. Do you have that here? Uh, I think they have. Yeah. Yes, it was just Richard Horizon. Feynman yeah. talking, head and shoulders, talking about his, his children and his father, and who had no uh, science background and all that sort of stuff. And my mum watched it, and she had no interest in science at all. She could never understand why people in Australia didn't drop off the planet, you know. And I thought Sometimes he seemed, we do. You do, OK. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I thought that he, you know, he seemed very accessible from, from seeing him on television. It's funny, isn't it? And I kind of went, when I arrived there, I went and knocked on his door kind of very apprehensively and I said, oh, you know, my mother's got no interest in science, you know. Um, do you think you could write to her? Because then I might have a better chance of teaching her physics. And he wrote her a letter and he said, Dear Mrs. Chown, ignore your son's attempts to teach you physics. Physics is unimportant. Love is important. So I got, you know, the world's greatest living physicist, he's dead now at the time, um, telling my mother that physics was unimportant. But then again, he used to, he used to Sunday nude on top of the physics building. He did, that's right. Hug all the sec secretaries and write his papers in topless bars. Yeah. He played, he played uh, the bongos as well, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. But there was a reason for that, really, because yeah. his, he, he married his childhood sweetheart and she died of tuberculosis yes, when he right. was working on yeah. the atomic bomb when he was in his 20s. Yeah. And he wasn't even able to grieve about it because, um, you know, they had to work on the, on the bomb. And uh, so I think he kind of became very philosophical about life in later years, you know, uh, and tended to enjoy himself, really. He was... Um he was adored by his students, though, wasn't he? I, I remember reading that... Uh, I think he died in 1988 or thereabouts, something like that. Yes, he did, uh, yeah. And when uh, he died, on the, the biggest building in Caltech, uh, there was a huge banner unfurled by the students that said, Dick, we love you. 
um, which must have uh, brought a tear to many eyes. Yeah, um, yeah. And, I, and also, I mean, he, he was not just this great character and this great physicist, but he was very good at explaining things to people as well. Uh, many of the people that I've met who are very intelligent cannot remember what it was like before they understood anything. And they're, compl- <laughs> and they're, comple- <laughs> and they're completely unintelligible. Um, but... but Feynman was at the very top of the tree, you know, he was really very, very good. Yeah. Uh, and yet he could remember what it was like not to know. And his criterion of whether he understood anything was whether he could actually explain it to a person waiting for a bus. Yes. And if he couldn't, he realised he didn't understand something. And, and really, you know, I don't equate myself with Richard Feynman, but I, I kind of, that's my criterion of whether I understand anything, really. Whether I can explain it to my wife, when I, whether I can explain it to someone, you know, mowing on someone's lawn. Um, and I think that's a good criterion, really. Fantastic. And I think Einstein also was yes. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so do you go up to people at bus stops and try and explain things to see whether you understand them yourself? Well, I, I, I don't actually, but unfortunately, uh, you know, people who sit next to me on trains have a terrible time. <laughs> because, I, 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 they, unfortunately, I go, I, go, I go home and I tell my wife and she says, oh, no, you didn't sell them one of your books, did you? <laughs> and, and, I just went to the Edinburgh Science Festival and this poor woman sat next to me for four and a half hours and in the end she went off saying she would buy one of my books. (laughs) It it took you four and a half hours to persuade her. (laughs) It did take me four and a half hours. She was very chatty. Uh, I wrote a children's book, a children's fiction, and I I found out, did you have any grandchildren? I said to her and she said, yep, yep. So I I managed to get her to buy my children's book. Very good. I am quite bad about that. (laughs) Now, I always say to my wife, it comes up naturally in conversation. Um, uh, It it does. Uh, You probably simply can't help yourself. I can't. I I am very envious of your... um, your connections with Feynman, though, because uh, for all physicists of my generation, Feynman was somebody that, uh, that we looked up to. The, the only name I can drop in a similar vein is that I once tripped over Stephen Hawking, um, which, uh, w- w- which is not quite the same as having I went been swimming. I went swimming with Stephen Hawking Did you? once. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, my, my life kind of intersects all these very famous people, very tangentially, really. <laughs> but, but, yeah, when I was at Caltech, I, was, I used to swim in an outdoor swimming pool and no one, it's a very academic place, nobody does any exercise at all. And, and like their, their American football team last won in about 1936 or something. <laughs> and I used to swim up and down this pool, and, uh, and then one day I just looked up and there was Stephen Hawking on the, at the end of the swimming pool. And I, I didn't even think that he was well enough to travel, you know, and, and there he was in California. And his children were playing in the shallow end, you know, so he was there with his children, they're obviously grown up now. Um, I don't know what he would have done if, you know, if, if one of them had got into trouble. Yeah, but but uh, difficult. Yeah. So I can say I swam with Stephen Hawking. I that's, didn't really. He was kind even, of nearby. Even better than tripping over Stephen Hawking. <laughs> <laughs> tripping over Stephen Hawking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was the time when he had his voice. Because um, I didn't okay. understand his voice, but he spoke with... He had his, a his own voice. Who interpreted oh, him, okay. yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I didn't understand what he was saying. But, um, right. and, uh, and he was a great... Uh, he was like Feynman. He was a great kind of... Um, a, you know, people would go to his talks, but nobody understood what he was talking about. Yes. They would go because he was a celebrity. Yes. And he used to find that quite amusing. Because yes. from the questions, you could find... You know, no one really understood what he was talking about. <laughs> talking of questions, we have <laughs> just a few Sorry. minutes left. Sorry. Um, and I would very much like to invite uh, a few questions from the audience. There's a gentleman there already with his hand up. Uh, you, you had your hand up, sir, about uh, 30 minutes ago, so <laughs> I did take note. I get the impression from your talk that um, quantum mechanics or quantum theory really completely um, contradicts conservation law. Yes, it does. Um, what does it do to conservation law? It does actually, yeah, that's right. I mean, things can pop into existence in, in, the, in the vacuum out of, out of, out of nothing. It's, it's, it appears that the laws of physics turn a blind eye to certain things. It's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know, your, your, if you've got a son, they, they borrow your car uh, <laughs> overnight, um, drive it around, but they get it back in the garage before you notice it's gone. <laughs> and that's very much the way it is with... with don't even say that. With quantum theory. <laughs> You know, matter can literally pop out of nothing in empty space as long as it's vanished before the laws of physics have noticed. 
So, <laughs> empty space is actually seething. It's a seething, it's seething with all this stuff that's popping in and out of existence, according to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So, yeah, the, 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 the macroscopic large-scale laws that we see can all be, all be broken by, by quantum theory, but it ten, tends to be for short intervals of time. The second question is, isn't it about time that cosmologists and um, astronomers dump the concept, the fallacious concept of black holes? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think probably black holes exist. Um, we ha no one's actually seen one because they're, they're kind of black. And they're How also can they be? And they're also, also very small. How can they be holes? Um, and, uh, uh, but, but we have a lot of... A lot of uh, circumstantial evidence oh, that they exist. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like the, the situation with atoms about 100 years ago, where there was overwhelming evidence that atoms existed, but actually no one had seen one. In fact, no one saw an atom until 1980. Um, yes, but we, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but we really knew that they existed, and I think that's probably true of black holes. And certainly within the next 10 years, even less than that, we will actually image effectively the black hole at the centre of our yeah. galaxy, which has got a mass of about three million, two, three million solar masses. So I think we'll have confirmation that they do exist fairly soon. Hmm. It's, um, I, I agree, but I think your question goes to the, the nub of the matter in the sense that it's that, that, um, that conflict between something very small at the centre of a black hole and yeah. what relativity tells us. There's a question at the front here. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, this year is the 50th anniversary of C.P. Snow's Two Cultures. It is, it and, is. Uh, while, uh, <laughs> while you were talking, I was wondering if, if the organisers had stuffed up and, and filled the audience with people expecting a very literary sort of discussion, would the reaction have been any different than it might have been 50 years ago? Oh, that's a lovely question. I don't know. Oh, sorry, so, I, sorry, I didn't really hear your question because I was, I was thinking of an a Indian restaurant I go to in London which is called <laughs> Curry Doors of Power. You know, which of course is C.P. Snow's famous book, Corridors of Power. Anyway. It, it, <laughs> so you it, sort of get a feel for what the Vindaloo might be like. No, is that the, <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually just over Westminster Bridge, and, it, and a lot of politicians used to go there, you see. So curry, curry doors, Corridors of Power, Corridors of Power. Yeah. Sorry, you think... What, <laughs> I, 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 no, no, so you, you, you're wondering, do, would, would have the barriers come down? I really, really hope so. I mean, popular science, for instance, as a genre, I mean, really, we're talking about 20 years. I mean, people did write popular science, but until Hawking kind of sold 10 million copies and, and, and created a separate, um, you know, you know, shelving space in, 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 in book, <laughs> bookstores, <laughs> did, right. uh, it didn't really happen. So, yeah, I think things, things are, are definitely getting, getting better. You um, know. I, I agree. And I think... Uh, like for, for Forgive me for putting in my two pennies. No, I, I mean, I, I do think there is now a literature of science, and, and I think uh, Marcus is a um, masterly exponent of this, in which uh, the scientific concepts, uh, which at one time would have been the whole purpose of the article or the piece of writing or literature, actually become uh, not subsumed, but um, perhaps on a more equal footing with the story itself, the way the story is told. I do believe that we are seeing a new era of, of writing about science, which actually puts it firmly in the, in the mm. realm of literature. I was thinking, because uh, I write for a magazine called New Scientist in England, which has got a very large circulation. I think it's read by about 800,000 people. Uh, but that was actually started on the strength of a speech by Winston Churchill in the 1950s. He said that in a modern society, the average person really needed to know a lot more about science. And he was obviously quite an influential person. And the magazine was started on the strength of that. There's a question uh, near the front. Sorry. Yeah. Yep, sir. Oh, there you are, sorry. Sorry, sir. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I've been wondering if uh, the nature of... Um dark energy is not understood, how can it be that quantum mechanics can show that its effects are 10 to the 120 power too small? Well, I mean, we, we can predict what... I told you the, the, the vacuum is not empty. In the, in the modern picture, the vacuum of, of space is seething with energy, and quantum theory can predict what that energy should be. And it, uh, that's where it over-predicts what we actually observe by a large, large factor. 
Good, thanks. Okay, thank you. And there's a question at the front. Yeah, I'm trying to understand how quantum theory affects us in a practical sense. Yes. So, health, healing, happiness. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if we're actually vibrating energy, how does this whole theory that we've come to in the early 1900s affect our medical system, for example, when you look at the Eastern philosophies always working on energy, and we're saying, okay, it is all energy, how, how come this isn't filtering through to the medical profession? And I'll leave it at that because it's too big. Well, I think it doesn't really... It, it, you know, one of the interesting things about this theory is it doesn't have uh, many obvious manifestations on, uh, on, in the everyday world, which is why it took us until the 1920s to notice it. You know, uh, again, all these amazing quantum things do not manifest themselves on the whole, on the, on the large scale. Although they are responsible for a lot of the everyday world. I mean, they're responsible for the fact that there's variety in the world. You know, the fact there isn't one type of atom, but there are 92 different types. Mm. That comes from what we call the Pauli exclusion principle. So they have generated the, the, the everyday world, but, but many of the phenomena, the weird phenomena, do not manifest themselves on the everyday world. On the other hand, um, Roger, you mentioned Roger Penrose. And Roger Penrose, who, who um, did a lot of uh, work on black holes with Stephen Hawking in the 70s, um, and is a very, very well-respected physicist, does believe that the brain is a quantum computer. You yes. know, he believes that the brain is exploiting quantum processes, and that's behind creativity and imagination. Um, and he's identified these structures called microtubules in the brain, which he says do quantum computing. Um, it's hard to imagine because I told you quantum, uh, the quantum of theory is a theory of isolated systems. Well, the brain, you know, it's difficult to have anything isolated in the brain when there's water and things going, you know... It's three pounds of jelly. Three pounds of, yeah, that's, that's right, right, three yeah. pounds of jelly and water. <laughs> yeah. um, and it kind of smacks to me of, of you know, consciousness is uh, mysterious, quantum theory is mysterious, therefore they must be connected. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, that, it's kind of that logic... But, yeah. but, but then again, Penrose might be right. I mean, it, you know, evolution has had four billion years to exploit the, 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 you know, the natural world. Why would it not have exploited, um, you know, quantum, quantum yeah. theory? Why, why would it not have done that? I, I mean, for, me for putting in my two pennies on this, but, uh, but I think what you've touched on is very important because I think it tells us that there are things in the natural world that we simply do not understand. We can see little glimpses of things, and yes, we hear anecdotal evidence of, of people thinking in terms of energies and things of that sort. Um, somebody put the question to me uh, a little while ago about quantum entanglement, uh, the fact that uh, you can change a photon of light at one end of the universe and its twin mm. which, with which it's entangled changes instantaneously at the other in a quantum sense. Um, pe uh, somebody put that question, does that explain why identical twins have telepathy? And I think the answer is no, it doesn't. But, um, but it, it raises all kinds of interesting areas um, mm. and suggests that perhaps one day uh, what we think of mm. as physics and um, uh, the physics of the everyday world today might actually encompass much, much more than it does now. We might be able to see the way in which quantum effects um, perhaps uh, pervade uh, our, our, our world in a, uh, on the macroscopic scale. Well, the interesting thing about entanglement, which is probably one of the most amazing um, quantum phenomena, really, you know, the fact that you know, there can be instantaneous communication between things, even if they're separated by vast dif distances. Um, uh, but this tends to happen between quantum particles that were born together, you know, they, tend, they don't have to be actually, but it tend to be, they tend to be born together and separated. Um, well, of course, all the particles in the universe were born together. They were born together in the Big, <laughs> the big bang. bang. That's right. So, in some way that we don't quite understand, they may well be connected by some kind of yes. web of, 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 of everything in creation, you know, may be connected in some way we don't really know. Yes, sir. <laughs> It took me a long time to realize that inflation only happened a split second after the Big Bang and only lasted for a split second. And now it's presumed that it's still going on. Does it have anything to do with dark, dark energy or not? Well, that's a very good question because uh, inflation was driven by a very unusual state of the vacuum. We, we call it a false vacuum, which had repulsive gravity. So it has great similarities with the dark energy today. So we have inflation, you know, it, it drives the expansion of the universe for a split second and then dies. And then billions of years later, 
dark energy appears. Yes. So, you know, it kind of sus- there's a suspicion there that there might be a connection, but no one really knows, do they? Well, uh, that's right. I mean, uh, inflation, we think the universe uh, in, in increased its size by 10 to the power 50, is that right? In 10 to the minus 35 of a second. It's nothing to do with the dollar going uh, down in value, but it's to do with things getting bigger, and it happened very, very quickly. And, yes, we don't understand. But perhaps if you come back uh, this time in a decade <laughs> and listen to Marcus again uh, in the future, um, we may well know about these things. And I can't imagine, and I'm sure you won't be able to imagine either, anybody more well-suited and more easy to listen to in explaining the intricacies of the universe uh, than Marcus Chown. So thank you ever so much, Marcus. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time. Thanks oh. again.